Perhaps. Let's move on to the hurling this weekend. I'm delighted to say Tommy Walters with us. Tommy, good morning to you. How are you? Yeah, good morning, lads. Uh, I, I'm always... Uh, I think we, we kind of... Uh, in the, the build-up last year to the game between Cork and I think it was Limerick, we were like, oh, this is going to be really interesting to see exactly where Cork are. And then Cork put out a bit of a shadow team. And I've always thought that it was a terrible, terrible mistake last season because it never gave them an opportunity to see in the full throat at that stage of the season where they were versus the best team in the country. There's been no false teams from Cork at any stage over the course of the league. They're going full bore for this. And I presume it's going to be the same this weekend, that there's just this sense of this team wanting to win everything now. Yeah, because you can't beat habits and good habits and winning habits. They're so important when it comes to the crunch time, Jer. When the game is in the melting pot with maybe five minutes to go and you're a pint up or a pint down, that's when you really need to have experience of being there and done that. So you start putting out shadow teams, Jer. I don't care if it's a you know a water crystal or a Welsh Cup or an early a challenge match. If you're going out and you're only half heart in any game, that could happen to you then at any stage uh, for, the, for, for the next year. Alex Ferguson always said it, like, if you did it once, you can do it again. And the opposite uh, is also so true. If you can put out a full team in a crunch game and cut, you know, like, say last week against Kilkenny, Kilkenny got off out of the starter blocks. They were on fire, playing a lovely brand of hurling. They were scoring goals. The Kilkenny crowd was buzzing. And they stuck with them and stuck with them. And as we had 10 minutes to go in crunch time, car came good and it's them kind of game stand here Ger, uh, when it comes to championship the only time that it affects you as you said if you power a dummy team so when you do lose say it with 10 minutes to go if you start falling away you can start laying on the excuses oh so we didn't power a full team we didn't really want to win it but when you go to win it and happen to do it well that gives you the great experience that you can bring forward into the crunch times in championship and like they're going out against Waterford this weekend they'll be putting out like we seen last weekend they took off Patrick Horgan I've never seen that before. So they do mean business and they are preparing for a championship, I think, mentally as much as physically. And how important would it be for this group to win something? Um, well, I think very important for them to try and win it, that you're not going out half-heartedly. I, I think they've, they will gain huge confidence from last weekend against Kilkenny. They always know a Brian Cody team. They will never lay down. They'll never power a dummy team. Uh, every match is an all earned final to that team. So a win over them in a league semi final is worth its weight in gold. I don't think it's hugely crucial because, uh, you know, some of these lads, they have under 21 All Ireland's, they have Munster finals, uh, you know, more the older guys, they, they have Munster championships. So I don't think a title as such is hugely important to them. But I think if they could, you know, win it, it'll give them huge confidence maybe down the road if they do happen to beat Watford or happen to meet uh, Cork. I think it's more important, to be honest, Jer, that Watford get a title. Okay. I think this, this team has lost a lot of finals. Well, before, um, before we get yeah. into Waterford in too, many, too much detail, because this is kind of our last opportunity to talk properly about Kilkenny for a while before the, the championship starts, we said last time you were on that we'd learn a lot more from them over the la next couple of weeks, um, the, the last couple of big games they had. And you'd have to say the signs are very positive, but it's probably a fairly accurate reflection of where they are at the moment. They're just that little bit behind the best teams in the country. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. I think the top three in the country are Water, Cork and Limerick. There's no doubt about that. The start of the year, we thought Limerick were out on their own. They went through, you know, a bit of a... Uh, a patch where things weren't going so well for him, but the, the two pretenders to the throne, Cork and Watford, who have been producing it during the last couple of years and have been producing underage, they've been coming firing on all cylinders and definitely are up there just with Limerick, I would even say at this stage. Just underneath then you have the rest, and Kilkenny are probably, in my opinion, probably top of the rest. Um, but what's so exciting from a Kilkenny point of view is the brand of Hurland they're playing. Listen, we all love the game, the old way. Get the ball up, every forward wins, you know, wins his own ball. But the game has changed so much, and it's because of your competition. You're now not just playing against six backs. Sometimes you could be playing against seven or eight. So just lumping the ball forward and trying to win your own ball, it's just it's not as easy anymore. It's grand if the other team goes 15 on 15, but most teams don't. Like say last weekend, now you have Mellerick kind of, you know, he's covering, we'll say, the centre forward. Say last weekend it was Park, he was covering him at times. So you're probably not getting the free pass out and over the bar. Um, the centre back Mark Holm and then can go back sweeping but it's not a sweeper as such it's just that he's playing kind of a you know a right keen type of midfielder like you're always back helping your defenders and um, that's what Mellerick I think he's after adding huge uh, to that Cork team 
So, yeah, Kilkenny, I think where they've learned is in the first half, Jerry, we saw they played a beautiful brand of hurling up through the lines at times, long at times, just varying it around. Towards the thought in the second half, when it really came down to it, it was passed back to Murphy and launch it up. So I'd say, you know, if they, they go back and analyse that match, uh, where it was won and lost or where they produced the scores, we'll say, versus where it kind of fell apart as such for them. And I would say it was definitely with the way they probably went more long in the second half. And listen, there is definitely a place for that long ball, but only if it's to advantage your team. You're not just driving it up kind of with, with your eyes closed. And I definitely thought in the second half, a lot of balls went back to Murphy. And even if they do go short, Jared, it's much harder to build an attack from the goal um, because so much can, you know, a, a pass just maybe half a, an, half a yard to the right or to left, it's gone from you. It's, 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 it's much more difficult to do. But if you're building from the half-back line, so instead of turning back, you turn forward and take three or four steps, lay it off with a 20-yard pass, much easier to do that. Or drive it into the corner, you'll have your vision, your, your head will be up and you might see a run from Billy Ryan or Mossy Keown or TJ hopefully when he's back. So I would like to see more of Hurling like they did in the first half than the second. And so are you concerned that they went away from that under pressure? Is that a sign that they don't fully believe what they're doing? Or is that just natural because it's only betting in? What's, the, what's your instinct about that? Yeah, from playing myself, so hard to change a style overnight. So I think it, it, it's, it's, it's not that they don't believe in it. I'd say it's just when it came to it, possibly they might have lost. You know, there was a couple of ones that went out around midfield, maybe Keane Kenny and a few of them where they lost it. And maybe they said, right, let's start going long again, you know, the safe option, as opposed to maybe, listen, we lost that one, but we'll win the next one. So I think it's just, you, you made a great point there, bedding it in, like, that's what this is all about. So I think this could actually benefit us more, that they have the experience now of, right, lads, when it came to it, when we lost a couple of the short ones, we just started going long all the time. And as I said, there's no harm in going long, but just not all the time and when it's not the best option. So I think they'll go back and look at that and they'll work on training the next couple of weeks. That, right, lads, a couple of these could go, you know, could go wrong around the midfield and could go back over the bar. Well, let's stick to it. It has worked for us and we have to do it because this is what the top teams are doing and this is how we're going to win in All-Ireland. So I think the, you know the way they say you learn more in defeat than you do in, in, in victory. I don't always believe in that. But in this instance, I would, as regards, you learn more by seeing how the long ball broke down as opposed to what was working for you. And and I, I'm not instigating that you go short all the time at all. Um, geez, you know, a ball into the square is, is brilliant at times too. Um, it's just that you don't go all one way or the other. Do you think sometimes Cody gets a bit of a, a hard rap when it comes to conversations around innovation within hurling? Like he's been getting a lot of credit over the last little while because, I mean, there, there's this idea out there that, that he's kind of moving with the times finally. But... God, I wonder over the last couple of years has he actually shown that innovation anyway they just haven't been winning All-Irelands like if you take the, the 2019 All-Ireland semi-final and, and getting the job done over that great Limerick team I mean I, I wonder do we, do we sometimes quickly forget some of those great moments from Kilkenny down through the last couple of years they just haven't had the players to get over the line in an All-Ireland final Yeah I agree with John um, like if you go back and look at the All-Ireland champions over the last couple of years like like people People tend to, you know, what's popular, what's new, what's different. People love jumping on that bandwagon. But, like, if you're in the Brian Cody camp, like, who has won the All-Ireland since Kilkenny? 2016, Tipperary, very much, you know, movement, plenty of different, plenty of movement. You know, Callan was kind of left inside in his own two-man full forward line. But definitely, you know, a lot of long ball. 17, um, Galway won it. Again, the same thing, big physical team. Uh, forward line, we're doing a lot of rotating, a lot of moving, canning, Niall Bork and the lads. Uh, we played them in 2012, first time I've seen. You scored, they moved on to a new position. And um, you didn't know kind of who you were marking a lot of the time. You just had to pick up the nearest man to you, you know, asking questions of, of the defenders. So 2017, Gall win, long ball. 2018, Limerick win. You know, they weren't playing the mid game they're playing at the moment. 19, Tipperary win again with long ball. Uh, then you have, obviously, Limerick kind of took over then after that. So, like, has, has the other style of hurling you know, made teams be champions. No. You know, Limerick, yes, but Limerick have a brilliant team. I'd say they'd win it anyway, they play it. But um but so go back to Cody and innovation, like from my experience of playing with him, we changed our style uh, in zero six to, to to play that Cork team with the running game. We changed our style in zero ten, uh, after winning four All Ireland's Tipperary, you know, the the, the 
you know, the tournament is over in the All-Ireland 2010 with different types of movement. Damon O'Shea like, put a lot of time into showing the guys how to move and we had to get our heads around that. He innovated there and, you know, he's innovated again now at the moment. And, um, you know, so listen, he, he does deserve credit that, like I always said, Brian Cody was never black and white. Brian Cody's probably greatest skill was his common sense. He was able to treat players differently, uh, treat teams differently. And, um, you know, very much a common sense approach to Hurling. And he's definitely shown, he's brought lads in with him. You know, Mickey Comfort, one of the top strength and conditioning guys in the country. I have experience with Mickey myself, just absolutely top class guy. Very good at, you know, the spirit of the camp as well. Um, brought in Connor Feely now, with plenty of experience there. And, you know, he's won county finals in Carlo. He's won Fitzgibbon Cups. This guy is with Kenny Camogie, plenty of experience as well. So, yes, uh, I would say sometimes um, it's not just black and white. Like, um, he, he's not just um, coaching teams, like, let's get the ball in. Like, he, he will change things up. He did also manage the transition from one of the greatest teams of all time uh, and keep the team competitive every year to the point where they were nicking some Leinster titles and beating that Limerick team. And, you know, it's it, we'll never know what life would have been like if he'd stepped away whenever you guys all stepped away. But at the same time, you know, he didn't have that great cast of players to call on and they have still been competitive. Yeah, and like you look at Manchester United after... Um, Say after Alex Ferguson left, changed around a lot of managers. Has that not changed? Um, you look at Arsenal, my team, the Gunners, back from the days of Ian Wright, right, right. Um, like they got rid of Wenger. Like how long were they trying to get rid of Wenger? And um, you know it's only starting to come right there now. Uh, you know under Arteta, they're starting to show maybe some potential there. You look at Bill Belichick over in the Patriots. Like uh, they said, he was the greatest manager of all time. Suddenly Brady was gone. You know, the quarterback of the, the greatest football player, you know, in my opinion, that, you know, listen, I don't have much experience with American football, but I think he, he d- deserves to be the greatest footballer, I'd say, of all time. Maybe Jerry Rice might be up there with him. But, like, you know, it's not all just black and white, get rid of the manager, suddenly yeah. everything changes. So, uh, let, let, yeah, I think he deserves huge credit. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Waterford and what they've done because, um, again, like the decision on... Uh, Liam Cal's point to stay was this like uh, we just all assumed in the off season that the temporary job was going to be his and he was going to go and that was just it because that was what we had assumed for a number of years but actually you know his decision to stay now makes perfect sense in retrospect that is a group of players who are completely wedded to his style and who are hurling for him and he seems like an absolutely brilliant brilliant manager so uh, of all of the stories that we would like to see in sport the Mayo footballers overcoming their hoodoo but Waterford winning an All Ireland at this stage will kick hurling into like the stratosphere, I think, just because this Limerick team are so good and they're going to be around for the next couple of years. But if Waterford could get over the line, what a rivalry that would be over the next couple of years. That's why, that's why we're genuinely excited about it and kind of hoping that we don't get let down again. Yeah, and like from a Water, Waterford perspective, these players, like forget about Waterford the county, but these particular players, they have experienced Gerald winning. They've won minor All Irelands, they've won twenty one All Irelands, they've won Fitzgibbons. Um, and now look at Bally Gunner. I think Bally Gunner should be the template for this, you know, the Watford as a county. Try, get beaten. Try, get beaten. 7, 10, 15, 20 years. Stay going, stay going. Up the standards. Try new things. Suddenly then, this year, uh, like, they're about to play St. Thomas's. And, um, you know, I'd say they probably would have preferred to play St. Thomas's in the all Ireland final, Bally Gunner, because, you know, they would have no... You know, St. Thomas's were just... You know, a small club in Galway, albeit a very successful, but maybe they wouldn't have had the same fear they would have Bally Gunner than Bally Hale. Bally, Gunner, Bally Hale never lose Club All Ireland. So, you get them in the All Ireland final, you're thinking maybe before the final, you know, our luck is out again. We're playing the greatest club team, hurling team maybe of all time. And they go out, they're getting beaten. Um, you know, things look like they were after coming back into it after Dizzy Hutchison's goal. Suddenly, then Owen Reid comes on, who scored so many important goals for Bally Hale over the years. He puts the ball in the back of the net. And, you know, even Shane Sullivan, so much respect for him after that final. And, and also Sully from, from college. He died in the Wool Valley Gunner, man. Loves hurling, loves the game. And he went down to control the ball. And it went under his hurl. And Henri put the ball in the net. And I'd looking at it on as a new shirt. You know, 
you know, damn, you're saying like you'd hate for that to happen to a player or a team in a final. They come back then and, and, and scored a, a goal with the last puck of the game. Shane Sullivan after that went on had a glorious last couple of minutes, you know, mentally very, very strong. So this is the template for Watford that you stay going. If it doesn't happen this year, go again next year a minute. So Jerry, I think the whole if, as long as they're not beating your team, I think the whole country would <laughs> yeah. love to see Watford in it all Ireland. <laughs> oh yeah, spoken to somebody very close to that border down there going, well, if, if they, we just avoid them. If they beat everybody else but us, that would be fine. Uh, how good are they? Yeah, no, they're excellent. They're building a huge panel. Um, like you see them last weekend uh, against Wexford. Like Wexford were coming and coming and after, they were in the tough uh, division of the league this year. And... Um, you know, got to the league semi-final on credit. I think they haven't been beaten, I think, this year, that Wexford team. And, um, like, Stephen Bennett is out injured. I don't know what's wrong with Stephen Bennett. Um, like, he was lighting up the league for, for the whole of the league, and he's after missing the last couple of matches. I thought they were maybe just resting him there in the last round of the league but against Kilkenny, but he missed again there the weekend. So you'd be hoping that there just maybe, it might be just a small little niggle that he'd be right for either this weekend or, or, or championship in two weeks' time. And they're missing Jamie Barron. Uh, Prunty wasn't playing again the weekend so they're building a huge panel here Ger, and that's I think the most important thing for them the championship is gone now where you win a match and you have three or four weeks off you win a Munster final you have four or five weeks off uh, now you need everyone because you're playing week to week and um, they're building a huge panel they're building uh, confidence I think the, as I said the Bally Gunner thing I think will give them huge confidence a lot of them players they got over the line when, when time was at its toughest so, yeah, they're good. Uh, why are they now suddenly potential uh, champions, Ger? You need forwards, right? Listen, they say defence wins championships, forwards win games, but any team that wins in all earned, they have a marquee forward or the marquee forwards. And they have, we'll say, Stephen Bennett, they have Shane Bennett, they have Ozzy Gleeson, but they have the star of the show, the, 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 the man that came back from across the water. Um, you don't go over to the Premier League um, you know, if you're only an ordinary talent, you have to be the elite of the elite. You're talking about the Premier League is not just a, a, an English league or a British league. This is the, probably the best league in the world. And he was over there nearly making it and came home because the, the attraction of the game back here brought him back. We're after seeing what he's done with Bally Gunner and we're seeing what he's doing with Watford. So he is the star forward that. Go back to the All Ireland final again. Ball came in, they're under pressure. Caught, he's used to the ball out in front here. Caught a ball. Uh, between him and his marker, buried it. Um, you know, the last couple of weeks, he's been scoring very, very important goals. He could have scored probably three last weekend. So he is the elite of the elite. And himself, along with the other guy, one man will not win a, win a championship. They've tied the work centre-back. So, like, the, in the key positions, right up along the field, they've, they've stars. Like, um, you go back to the Tipperary team that won, it was very successful with three All-Irelands. They had Callanan, Paddy Mar, you know, stars. Um, you go back to the Limerick team at the moment, they have stars. The, the, the Galway team that go over the line 17, the Canning, Dahi Burke, you know, Garrod. So, stars. You do need stars surrounded by a brilliant panel. And, um, you know, I think that that's that's what gives everyone hope, i say, within Mossford, um, that they have a panel, but they have stars within that panel. And maybe trying to figure out how to win a big game without Austin Gleeson may actually not be the worst thing in the world this weekend. Yeah, well, I, I think you're only a number um, on that. Like, you're there as part of the panel. And uh, just because he's gone, someone else steps in. And that's what the great teams, that's their their mindset, that's their personalities. Um, like, um, la, you know, they're missing Stephen Bennett, they're missing Barron. Like I say, at the start of the season, would you say Le Watford would be in a league final or, you know, being probably top of people, you know, in the top three of people's, you know, predictions to win a championship without Stephen Bennett, um, without Jamie Barron, Prunty and all these lads. I'd say you wouldn't, you know, Power Gomatney's only coming back. I suppose the Bally Gunner lads are only coming back recently. So you'd say no. Um, so I think Austin Gleeson's out, someone else comes in and, and on we go. You know, so I was disappointed to see Austin Gleeson getting sent off last weekend, you know, and it was, you know, I know lads will say, you know, I shouldn't have. But like, did anyone show him being shoved into the fence? Like, you know, and they're showing the camera angles there after the game. Like, you know, they're showing about 50 or 60, no, not 50 or 60, but they're showing, you know, five or six times the, the replays and replays of Aston Gleeson, you know, uh, just barely tipping back the hurl. I know, listen, it could have been dangerous. I, I'm not condone that for, for, for a second, but it was a little, a little tip, I thought. And, but listen, right, 
I, I'm not saying like the red cards are red cards in the modern game. That's the way it's gone. But they're not even sure that the camera angles of him being shoved into the fence. No. And I thought, you know, let's be fair about it. Okay, so there should be a consequence for provoking the foul and there should be a consequence for the foul as well. Just, I, can, I totally understand that. If you, if you were... If you're having a chat with him this week in training, everything is cold, everybody is calm. What are you saying to him? I was just saying to him, the game has changed, you know. Um, see, look, we've all grown up. The game has only really changed in the last couple of years with this kind of thing, Jar. Like, when we grew up, and Oster Gleeson the same, like, you know, he's 25 or 26 now. So he's playing Horan since he was probably 12, you know, it's a competitive Horan since he was probably 10, I'd say. So you're talking about 16 years ago. Um, you know, going back to the, to, to, to the early 2000s, the mindset back then was you look after yourself. If a lad comes up digging, yeah, you know, or shoving you around, look after yourself. Don't be going over to me looking for help. Don't be going to the rumpers. Don't be going to the referee. That's kind of softness. You know, look after yourself. I'm just saying this is the old mindset, the way it was when all these players were growing up, and you can't just change that overnight. So you'd be trying to educate them and just show them, right, Austin, this game has changed. Right, yes, it might not look good that you're going over to the referee telling them, did you see that, or going over to the umpire. Um, but that's just what you have to do now. This is the way, because everyone, like if RT aren't at the game, TJ Carroll are at the game. If they're not at the game, some sort of, you know, internet, uh, you know, live stream will be at the game. So camera angles are going to pick up that. And you can't look after yourself anymore. The game has changed. So I'd be just be more educating them than, than giving, them, giving them a scolding. Because, you know, like Liam Cal grew up in like Tipperary Hurland, tough from Ballingarry. Like, you know, that's tough Hurland. This is the way we were brought up. But it, it has changed regards just looking after yourself, you know. And um, so that's what I'd be saying to Austin during the week. That, listen, let's change this around now. Like DJ Carey, I remember DJ had a great one. Now, DJ never will say looked after himself. DJ said toughness, take the belts and punish him on the score scoreboard. And he was dead right. He was dead right. That is the real toughness. And um, but I remember we were playing a team one, one time, and um, we were talking about that. The, 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 we were playing a tough team, and you know, the, do we look after ourselves, or you know, do we maybe go to the referee, or what? You know, that what was the thing? Do you punish him on the scoreline? So DJ stood up one day and he said, um, no, lads, we'll punish him on the scoreline. No fighting fire with fire. He said, I was marking a, one, a lad one day, he said, and, and he was digging me all the game. And I said, DJ, no, calm it now. We'll punish him on the scoreboard. Next fall, he said, came in. I buried it, he said. And I said, I'm not finished his career. Well, he never played for that county again. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you the county or the name. I know who they are, but I wouldn't insult them there or that like that. But I thought, we still talk about to this day, like, it was one of the glorious saves before a big game that I've ever <laughs> witnessed. And, like, DJ, you know, I wasn't as mentally, I will say, tough. Regards, if a lad hit me, he'd be kind of, you know, getting back, kind of. But DJ was the toughest of the toughest. You hit DJ... He'd never hit you back. Next time you got the ball, he'd block you. He'd take it off you. He'd bury the ball in the back of the net. And Brian Cody, that was always his mindset to us. And that's what he always said to, to his teams going out. That's the real toughness. Take the belts and, and, and get on with it. So I think, you know, that's you'd be trying to maybe have that conversation with Austin during the week, you know. What would you have done if you were shoved into a fence? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> How long would the suspension have been? <laughs> well, listen, I've often presented medals around the country. You know, I can't do it. I'm very busy, but I have from time to time. But nearly the first thing a lad would always say to he'd be gritting his teeth, shaking around, say, "If I was marking you," he said, <laughs> <laughs> "And you know what he, what he do to you." <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I listen. I think you know yourself what I would have done back. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to win? Give us a prediction. It sounds like you're leaning Waterford. No, Cork. <laughs> <laughs> All we talk. <laughs> no, I think, I think, no, I, I think this, I think it's going to be a fantastic battle. I think it's going to be a battle of speed. Cork of unbelievable speed. I think, you know, down in Parky Creeve, it was huge, you know, I'd say they out, they outnumbered Kenny supporters, you know. Probably, I don't know, is there sixteen thousand? That is probably ten or twelve or thirteen thousand. Probably Cork, Cork are behind this team 
they sense there's, there's something coming down the line. They like the players. So there's going to be a huge buzz in Turles this weekend. And I think that's the way they're playing. They're playing with that Razzmatazz, that Cork team. And they're up against Was Cal Bravo Wofford, a mental toughness, a toughness that they're never bet. And um, so I think it'll be a huge, I think, battle, both mentally and I think it'll be speed versus Watford play it up the lines and try and get into a few moments of genius from the likes of Desi and Shane Bennett and maybe if Stephen Bennett is playing so I think just the way it's going at the moment I think Cork are primed for it and um, I think it, it could be Cork's uh, time to win Yeah. Uh, Alright we were talking in the football about a potential trilogy between Kerry and Mayo this is the start of a potential trilogy between these two over the course of the rest of the season as well and I for one am fully signed up for it Tommy good stuff that was great thanks yes. a million thanks a million good luck bye bye